Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about prevention and early intervention for alcohol and drug disorders and mental health conditions. We'll be talking about what's working and what's needed. Joining us in our panel today are Frances Harding, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Jane Callahan, Director, National Community Anti-Drug Coalition Institute, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, Alexandria, Virginia. Jordan Burnham, Mental Health Advocate, Active Minds Incorporated, Washington, D.C. Dr. Wendy Green, Assistant Director of Trauma and Critical Care and Program Developer, Screening, Brief Interventions, and Referral to Treatment Program, Howard University Hospital, Washington, D.C. Fran, what is the definition of behavioral health and how do we distinguish between prevention, early intervention, and treatment within that definition? The uh, definition for behavioral health for uh, SAMHSA is we're taking the um, substance abuse and mental health prevention, intervention, and treatment programs, and we're encasing it within the uh, disorder realm. So the substance abuse, prevention, intervention, and treatment are exactly the same, uh, uh, same levels, and so is mental health. We're finding that mental health properties for prevention especially are very similar to the properties of substance abuse. And treatment um, is different in one respect, but the intervention to get people into treatment is very similar. It is similar, but there are differences between the treatment aspect of substance use disorders and mental illnesses, correct? Yes, there are. Okay. Um, and we have different treatment centers uh, for substance abuse. We often have centers for treatment. In mental health, we have mental health services are, are delivered by many different realms. We have medical homes that deliver services. We have community centers that deliver services. You don't see traditional um, structures like in the substance abuse world for treatment. Dr. Green, what is the magnitude of mental, emotional, and behavioral health problems in our society? If you look at the national averages of mental health disorders, they may vary by regions. Um, but there, if you look at some of the underlying day-to-day -day anxieties, you can imagine that it can go upwards of 70% if you include a number of the less diagnosed or less appreciated disease processes. In our trauma population, we often see upwards of 60 to 70 percent of our patients may have some sort of mental health. We feel that the patient who actually has a trauma event and has some sort of substance abuse associated with it, be it alcohol or some drugs, because we usually have a poly substance abuse patient, we often find that they're not just drugging because they want to, but they're usually drugging to a problem. And that problem may be a mental disorder as their underlying problem, whether it be depression or otherwise. So the mixture of the two, trauma, depression, mental health, are very intertwined. And uh, Fran, I'm going back to you. Is there a difference between the level of, of, of um, stat in the statistics between mental health and addiction uh, issues? Yeah, around mental health, we have approximately 9.8 million um, adults, uh, and we classify that 18 years and older, um, that have a severe mental illness. And we have approximately, our studies are showing us that approximately 2 million young people between the ages of 12 and 17 have also been diagnosed as w with a major depressive episode. Um, with Compare that to a statistic for substance abuse, for instance, uh, five thousand deaths occur in substance abuse with young people uh, ages 12 to 25 uh, with underage drinking in particular. So there is a difference um, as well as the difference in cost which we can get into later. later. Jordan, you've had yourself some experiences with the problems of mental illness and substance use disorders, correct? 
Right, and uh, I think the two and two um, go hand in hand. I think that, you know, myself, the first time I picked up a drink was when I was a freshman in high school. And statistics show that ages 12 to 17, um, a, a young adult in that age, um, they're twice as likely to pick up their first drink or drug um, if they experience um, some type of depression within that year. And I was diagnosed with depression in 10th grade. And for me, I look at, you know, when I speak to high school and even college students, is that that seven out of ten young adults who have a serious substance abuse problem also have a serious mental health issue that's occurring with that. So I think, again, they do go hand in hand. It's quite high, isn't it? Yes, that, that statistic. And how did you manifest the problems? Did your parents, were your parents aware of the difficulties that you might have been having? Yeah, I think my parents were very aware of the problem of me drinking, but um, one of the problems was that no one wanted to see what the root was of the problem of me drinking. Everyone looked at me drinking and saying, well, that's why he's not doing that well in school, or that's why he's not feeling that great. But no one wanted to go to the X factor and say, this is why he's drinking that's getting him to that point. And so when were you finally assessed? When did you start and when were you finally assessed? Um, 10th grade when I was 16, um, that's when I had um, a very bad argument with my parents. That led me to go see a therapist, which at that time I didn't want to do. You know, six, being a 16-year-old um, male student, I just felt as though I could keep all my emotions on the inside. Anything that I was going through, I could drink it off, I could play sports and not worry about it. So I definitely wasn't in favor of going to see a therapist. Um, but during that time when I went to go seek therapy, one thing that I wasn't completely honest about was my drinking, which was something that hindered me along the way that led up to my suicide attempt. It seems that you were already engaged in a system that was going to provide you assistance when you attempted that suicide attempt. So if you can talk a little bit about that progression. Right. When I was diagnosed um, being 16, I didn't know how to handle it um, because depressed and depression are two words that are used over and over again in society. I didn't know what the difference was between being depressed and being diagnosed with depression. Um, and it was explained to me that when someone's depressed, they know why they're crying, why they can't get out of bed, why their appetite might be a little different. But with someone with me with depression, I can wake up one day and have no idea why I'm crying, why I feel like I don't want to get out of get out of bed while I feel unmotivated. And so it was a process in getting to learn my depression, having to take medicine, knowing that it's not a cold. It doesn't go away after a couple weeks after you take medicine and see a therapist. It was a process, but something that I didn't follow through with. Um, I fell into a lot of tricks that young adults do by taking my antidepressant for about a month, feeling great and feeling well, I'm cured from depression. Stop and so you would stop medicine. taking them. Exactly. And it was in that period that you attempted to, to commit suicide. Yes, along with self-medicating, with drinking, and taking my antidepressant on and off. That's what led up um, to my suicide attempt um, by going out of my nine-story bedroom window. Well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> Thank and you. We're glad, glad to be you here. got the appropriate help. Um, so, Jane, you know, given all these sets of circumstances, what do parents really, in terms of beginning to assess uh, a young lady or a young uh, man in their home, what do they need to know? How do they, what, what's, what signs do they need to look for? Well, that, that is a really good question. And I think all the parents who are out there uh, viewing this um, program are wondering, what can I do to increase the likelihood that my kids uh, don't end up with um, problems that lead to suicide, depression, or substance use. And I think the most important thing, first of all, is just be a really good parent and listen. Um, and then secondly, educate yourself um, and learn about these, these things, learn about community resources, and uh, work together with other parents, particularly in your schools and your communities, to make sure that all of your kids together um, are getting what they need to grow up to be healthy. Um, and avoid problem behaviors. And when things do surface, I think it's really important for parents not to necessarily blame themselves, um, but definitely proactively get the kind of support they need, both for themselves and their children, to increase the likelihood that little problems won't turn into great big problems. Yes. Fran, what do we tell parents in, in those situations? Well, I think we tell parents, both um, Jane and uh, Jordan talked about the role of parents and how important in each of their stor uh, stories that 
parents um, have. They are the first line to see their young people um, changing their behaviors, as Jane was saying, and some of the signs that, that were out there. Uh, we need to tell parents and remind them first and foremost that addiction is a disease and this, it's not their fault and it's not their young person's fault. They need, they need to know that as well. And if they do what Jane said, listen, watch the stu their, their young people, be interactive with them, get to know their friends. They need to know the signs of what's a normal life for for a young person and when their child begins to act a little differently than they used to act two three years ago that should send some signals to go get help jordan your parents obviously saw signs mm -hmm. in you they may not have understood it and that's okay we're not asking everyone to be clinicians but when you begin to see your young person changing their friends drastically when they start to become seclude themselves or they just don't seem right is a time to take them to the pediatrician or a doctor or a therapist or, or whomever. The worst thing they could do is nothing. Jordan. A lot of times what parents ask is, how can I start that conversation with my child? Because it might feel awkward, it might feel wrong to have that conversation. And two tricks that I always give to parents is one, Everyone asks, how are you doing? In our society, we all say, how are you doing? Um, to make kind of that positive connection, to start a conversation, I tell parents, ask your kids how they're feeling. And that can change the entire dialect of a conversation by just one word, how are you feeling? And the other thing is relate. Um, I know my parents and I used to do this thing called highs and lows. At dinner, we would talk about our highs for the day, what we loved, and then our lows. What was our down point for the day? And for me, that secured me to know that I'm not just going through a bad day. My mom, my dad, they can have a bad day too. So always relate and try to start, start a conversation is a good tip for parents too. And when we come back, we're going to be talking more about what parents can do, what programs that are available, and how everyone can really get engaged and get involved to prevent substance use disorders and mental illnesses in our young people. We'll be right back. It's really important uh, from the evidence that we have that just doing uh, prevention activities or services in one setting isn't enough. Uh, for example, a young person needs to hear the same thing from parents that they hear from their schools, that they hear from their health care provider, that they hear, hear from their church. So these messages and the activities and the direction that a community is trying to go needs to support uh, each other. Um, it's important whether it's uh, changing norms about the way children uh, view alcohol and substance use or about the way they seek help or are supported in seeking help. And that really takes everybody uh, assisting those children and youth and the families uh, all together in the same way with the same messages. Well, a prevention prepared community dovetails into a recovery oriented system of care because again, you're mobilizing the resources of the community to, to create a supportive environment. So you have a strong schools, so you've got parents interacting with the schools. In a recovery oriented uh, uh, community, you, what you're trying to do is make sure that you have access to the agencies in the community. So all the agencies in the community are operating to support the individual in the recovery. In prevention prepared community, all the agencies in the community are operating to support the uh, children, the young adults in the community. You've got strong uh, supervision so in the prevention prepared community, so parents are actively involved, just as family is actively involved in recovery oriented system of care. It's not that the individual is by himself or herself. Uh, it isn't just their problem. Same thing with a prevention prepared community. The community understands that if a child does not have support, that child becomes the community's problem as well as the child having uh, his or her own problems. I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here. And then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had and the most important. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
It's very therapeutic to be able to go around the country to um, tell my story to young adults, to adults, um, therapists, psychiatrists, whoever may listen, because I feel that's something that I didn't have before. You know, struggling with my depression and my stress and anxiety, I felt like I didn't have a voice. So to be able to speak about what I do and speak about my story and where I came from, I think it's important because I know that there are people listening that can relate to at least one or two parts of my story. And, and that's the great thing because four out of five Americans Americans are affected by mental health and that shows that so many people are related to mental health in some type of or form of way and I think that's why the conversation needs to be had because the statistics out there show how many people are affected by it how many people deal with it themselves personally and to have that conversation is really where the education starts and that's what's the most important. Fran we started talking about uh, what parents can do but let's go back a little bit and let's talk about what happens if we really do not prevent these problems w within the, the population of young adults and other populations that we really have to engage with well first and foremost I think your viewers would be interested that it's predicted by not by 2020 2020 behavioral health disorders now remember that's substance abuse and mental health will surpass all other chronic diseases as the major health problem for our country that in itself grabs your attention to break it down even further approximately 250 billion dollars is spent each year on the cost of mental and emotional and behavioral disorders to add to that, over 500, or 500 billion, I'm sorry, it's 200, 200 billion and 500 billion dollars is cost to our society for addiction disorders, uh, for instance, substance abuse and alcoholism. So those are huge costs, especially during today, uh, during our, our current economics, that we, we can't afford to ignore. We have a saying in SAMHSA, which is behavioral health is essential to overall health. And that's our goal, is to help our country understand by looking at and treating and preventing and interventing and intervening rather into behavioral health, substance abuse and mental health issues. We'll save our country a lot of money and a lot of health. And Dr. Green, it really goes beyond the treatment of mental illnesses and alcohol and drug use disorders, correct? I mean, there are other complicating factors of individuals that have those problems that then develop or may already be in the DNA of the person that has those problems, and then the problems are exacerbated like diabetes, uh, cardiovascular issues, is that correct? Yes, the patients who have a mental health disorder may have other chronic illnesses, and as such, when they don't take care of their mental health, they, then they may not take care of their overall body's health, too. Other things may get ignored, and whenever you ignore a problem and let it fester, you can imagine that the cost to health care becomes triple that which you could have done if you had just spent the money in prevention on the first hand. So for every one dollar you spend in prevention, you're saving another three dollars uh, in, in health on the other end. You know, as a country, we do such a good job taking care of people's physical health, right? Correct. We've got all kinds of fancy diagnoses and machines and all those kinds of things. But when it comes to behavioral and mental and substance abuse issues, which really do contribute to all of those things, we don't do such a good job, do we? No, we, we don't. And th those efforts really need to be enforced mm -hmm. and, and supplemented. Um, unfortunately, here in the District of Columbia, uh, we have some great programs that uh, need funding and implementation. Um, we know that we can do screening and brief intervention, but we need to get more referral centers so that once we get them identified, that we actually can provide some help for mm -hmm. people. And um, Fran, what are the recommended strategies? What does the research tell us in terms of the strategies to use to begin to address these problems? Well, for um, behavioral health and substance abuse, uh, mental, health, mental illness and substance abuse prevention programs, we want to get to the young people first. So we have several programs that target the zero to eight population, and obviously we don't teach young people at that age how not to drink or, or look at them for behavioral health issues, but we're looking at the families and the parents and the, and the communities that they live in. And that's what these programs do, is they go in, we do an assessment, 
We take an evidence-based program, we implement the program that's targeted to the specific needs uh, of that particular community, family, school, environment as a whole. We need to get in early and often. Mm -hmm. And Jordan, when you were um, going through your whole ordeal, did, were you able to really connect with, with the broader community? Did you find support uh, within that community? It was difficult for me personally to find kind of support in our community because mental health and the suburb area that I lived in, it was such a such shush shush, you know, topic. It was uh, very taboo. Well, that stigma I yes. think associated with it. As Absolutely, well. stigma. And the problem for me was that when someone asked me how I was doing or how I was feeling, I was ashamed to say because here I suffer from depression, but I went to school with this mask on my face like I didn't. And um, although it took all the way until 10th grade for me to be diagnosed with depression, in a way when I hear about the screening that we do for physicals, you know, every year that they do for schools, I'm thinking to myself, physically, we do screening for physicals every year, but how come we can't do that mentally? Uh, you know, elementary school, just physicals, just like you do that for physical things, why can't we do that mentally for children as well? And start it at the elementary age so that I would have known that in elementary school what I was going through with symptom, symptoms excuse me, of depression, middle school all the way into high school. And uh, I wish that was something that was implemented in my community. Jane, what is a prevention prepared community? Now that's a really good question, Yvette, and it's, it's a term I think we're going to be hearing a lot more. Uh, the notion of prevention prepared community is all those systems in the community, be they the healthcare sector, the business sector, families, schools, neighborhoods, law enforcement, they're all prepared uh, to create a prevention system for the community that really does increase the likelihood that everybody will be making an important contribution together and rates of these problems will actually decrease over time. Mm -hmm. Dr. Green, you mentioned screening and brief interventions. Can you, uh, many people uh, in the audience may not know what this program is all about. You want to tell us a little I, bit more? I'd be happy to, Yvette. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Howard University and Howard University Hospital has identified was that we had a large population of at-risk drinkers, substance abuse patients, and that we wanted to find a way to try to really help our population. We didn't have enough social workers or frontline people to do it. So what we had done was to put together a proposal for to train our residents. And SAMHSA was very helpful in that in providing us with a grant to train our residents and our staff about screening, brief intervention, and referral for treatment. So when a patient comes in on whatever service, they may not have come in for alcohol or substance abuse problem, but their results of their, the discussion may have been screening that patient just to see or is this person at risk? And then once you've done that, you really go through a process of educating the residents and staff about how you can have open-ended questions, affirmative listening, reflective listening, that really allows the person to open up and tell you what's going on. Now we know physicians and healthcare personnel are very busy, so the training was a uh, consinct one, uh, but it was effective. And the study, especially in the trauma literature, showed the reduction at the moderate risk drinkers was very impressive by allowing the physicians to come in and do these screenings and brief intervention. And the big thing that we emphasize is that we aren't telling the patient what to do. We're letting them know that you, we've given you the information, we know what the statistics are, now you make a decision. Is this something that you're interested? Are you interested in negotiating a, a different way of managing this? Do you wanna cut down from six drinks to three drinks a day? What is it that you wanna do? What have you done before that has shown that you can do a reduction strategy? Do you want help with this? So our goal is to really empower the patient it's not me telling you, you need to lose weight, you need to do this, this is the program. No, you decide for yourself that you're ready to do this. And then you feel more committed to it. And why do you want to change? What are the motivating factor, mm -hmm. factors? And actually asking them, there's a reason why you do it because something you get something out of it. It's not just all bad. There's a reason why people continue to go back to that drug. So you have to get to that route also. There is a reason why people continue with that particular drug. So empowering a larger group of healthcare professionals has been our mission and uh, we hope they'll continue to carry it on in their practice and then refer them for treatment. And really sharing the responsibility for the wellness uh, with the patient. Correct. Obviously, you know, it, it's a very important part. Buy-in. 
<laughs> absolutely. And it works, too. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the research shows that it really works. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Fran, Dr. Green basically told us that within screening and brief interventions, there are some referral issues, you know, that you tell the patient, this is where you may get help. Mm -hmm. uh, what components in a community need to be engaged in support of a program such as screening and brief interventions? Almost all the components that Jane just mentioned that makes up the community. You have to have the families uh, involved with that type of uh, an intervention in a screening process. 80% of most of the screenings that are done with the SBIRT program do not lead to a diagnosis. So what does that mean? That means only 20% need an actual traditional treatment. The other 80% need everything from a prevention program that's building awareness and education to a prevention program that is looking, targeting on their particular specific needs, whether they have, uh, they're, they're living in an, an economic environment that's very tough for them or, or they're uh, a certain ethnic group that doesn't feel like they fit well, things like that and or then they need that intervention they're not quite into the diagnosis but what they need is a strong um, program that uh, teachers and their physicians and their faith leaders can all rally around and help change the environment and their behaviors very good when we come back I want to talk about other programs that are also going to be very helpful to communities in need we'll be right back a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. decided that they wanted to have a talent show, that they would have an Annie Atts Got Talent night and invite the whole community to show some of the positive things that kids are doing, some of the talents that they have, help the kids feel good about themselves, have a nice, you know, adult and kid family community get together and have the kids have a lot of fun planning it, preparing it and putting it on and have the whole thing be sponsored by the Drug Free Coalition. So, you know, the message being, we know how to have a good time, drug free. So I just wanted to talk to you guys about the talent show and what we're working on. When are we going to do the actual show? Is it going to be in an evening performance, an after school performance? A prevention prepared community is um, a group of concerned citizens that come together and uh, meet and they, and they all have the same focus around substance abuse prevention. Any community can decide it's time to make the change. And let's really try to get, let's try to rally around and energize our neighbors to address this before we have the accidents, before we have the traffic crashes, um, before we lose more young people to substance abuse and all the things that come with it. The coalition is willing to come together and go through training together to make sure that they are, are looking at the data and the information about their community and assessing it in the correct way and then coming up with a plan or a project that addresses their needs. I really like the idea of, of building the positive. It's sort of like building health instead of treating a disease. Some of the specific challenges at a coalition level or a community level, engaging the key leaders, engaging the grandparents and parents and kids and all the sectors, bringing them in, and then giving each of them a role to play. 
and, and keeping that engagement over time is also a challenge. Our role is facilitation. The conversations take place between the youth and the community members. Usually within these community members, there is representation from law enforcement, from the business community, from the faith community, from elected officials, parents, students. I'm not with my 15-year-old 24-7. You know, I'm with her, you know, I work at the school, so I'm here, but I don't see her every day. I don't see her in between classes. And it's good that there's reinforcement to back me up saying, you know, don't drink, don't use tobacco products. You need to have the prevention to keep, to, to keep these risk factors either away or down to a minimum with youth. Showing alternative uh, ways to spend your time, mm -hmm. I think that's probably the ideal thing. And prevention is probably a lot easier since you're not already addicted to anything than having to quit later or going to rehab. Like I always say, I don't want to do that. I want to finish school and go to college. So. In this club, like you get to help people and you get to tell people like what things not to do. Like I have like experience with background, like with drugs and stuff, and like I don't want to go down that road. I want to go down a different road, so that's why I'm in this group. As a community, we are after the same goals, and um, knowing that we could work together and we could bring positive change uh, to the community is always very uh, rewarding. Dr. Green, going back to uh, screening and brief interventions, are there certain competencies that need to be highlighted while trying to implement that program? Definitely. The cultural competency piece is a specific part of our Know the Risk expert program at Howard University. We wanted to make sure that people understood that communicating to one group versus another may require some refinement. You may need to know where the people are coming from, what their background is. So we tried to incorporate this through a web-based program education as well as through lectures and didactics and role-playing so that the residents actually get a chance to un get an understanding. So when they come and actually talk to the person, they have some sense of history of who this person may be and why they are and maybe why they don't want to come and seek treatment. Mm -hmm. And how, how is that accepted among the folks that, that have been trained in the expert um, methodology? Well, the expert methodology has I would say taking a great role in not only improving the way they communicate for expert, but all communication. Because they have to learn how to talk with patients of different cultures for many different reasons. So it may not just be expert that they're talking about, but they take these same skills, this open-ended listening and reflective listening back to their own patient population for other reasons also. And they also incorporate, I know that um, we were talking about previously the, the whole issue of families not wanting to accept that there's a mental illness because they feel somehow people may discriminate against them and, and some people call it stigma, but it's really a discriminatory practice to, to not be able to accept the medical condition within the family. Uh, so I suspect they need to also learn about those issues. Definitely. Learning about the whole spectrum improves the health care provider and what they can provide, what assistance they can provide to their patients. And Fran, let's go back and talk about most of what we've been referring to has to do with alcohol and drug disorders. How about mentally, the mentally ill or the people with mental health problems? Is it similar? Are we learning to adapt ESPERT for that uh, community as well? Yes, in particular, ESPERT now is a billable service under uh, health insurance uh, to, for our screening for depression. And that is a big leap. That combined with parity legislation that has allowed us now to um, health insurance now have to pay for mental health services. Both of these maybe small steps in some respect are huge steps in our field because it helps take care of that discrimination and helps people become a little bit more accepting that we're talking about health, major health conditions, that they may be mental health, they may be emotional health. And as a matter of fact, emo language is important. Emotional health, this transcends to all of what we're talking about today under behavioral health. Because if you're emotionally healthy, you have a strong character, you have confidence in yourself, your family is emotionally healthy, we're looking at lowering risks for behavioral health problems across the board. And of course our audience needs to realize that under the parity law, 
uh, small businesses of more than 50 people that are already covering certain conditions need to also cover uh, mental health uh, conditions as well, correct? Correct. And some of your listeners may not realize that that has not been done before. And that's one of the reasons why parents struggle and why they may not talk to their young people very, at a younger age, simply because they can't afford it. So what would you do as a parent? You have something you can't really talk to anybody about. You don't quite understand it yourself. And your doctor is saying to you, well, if you want these services, you've got to figure out how to pay for it. Our whole health care system now is changing, and so will the health of our country. Mm. Jordan, given your experiences and the fact that you speak to parents, that you speak to um, populations within school systems, what do you think that communities really need to begin to do better in order to address some of these issues? I think that one thing I, I mentioned earlier was that um, kids need to feel and young adults need to feel as though they're not the only ones going through what they are, not just by their parents, but other people around them of the same age. You know, there was a statistic in the early 2000s, in uh, 2001, 2002, that even though 20 to 25 percent of young adults will suffer from a mental disorder in a given year, up to two thirds of those kids won't seek help. And a lot of that is because of that stigma and the fact that kids don't know if other kids are going through these topics or issues because there's no discussion. And um, that's what I, I try and promote when I go to speak at these schools, not just to talk to each other inside the school, but inside the entire community of all ages, and to implement um, programs, whether it's um, peer mediation between the students, or whether it's different activity nights for um, all ages to, um, again, continue the dialogue of mental health. In. Jane, we've talked about screening and brief interventions. Talk to us about what the Institute does uh, at CATCA yeah. and how it offers community an opportunity to really get engaged. Well, I'll try to be brief, Yvette, because as you know, that's my favorite topic. Uh, what we do at the um, Community uh, Anti-Drug Coalition Institute is we work with communities throughout the nation uh, to help them become prevention-prepared communities. Um, and get all of the different segments of the community working together uh, to not only implement programs, but also change systems and policies and practices and environments uh, to once again have a comprehensive approach to these problems. So uh, we're more likely as a nation to have communities uh, that are tackling these problems in serious and significant ways, which actually lead to results. And what, how do you do it? Uh, what is done? Uh, how can someone contact you mm -hmm. and, and make sure that they have access to the information, to the training? I suspect mm -hmm. you do training. Mm -hmm. For your audience, um, you can get in touch with us at CADCA, C-A-D-C-A dot O-R-G. Uh, go to our website and all the information is available there. And uh, what I'm really pleased um, about is the fact that we uh, really do have the capacity and the reach to help communities uh, start what we call community coalitions. And how do they do that? They do that by bringing community members together, different segments of the communities together, to identify local conditions that are important in their communities to address, and then developing uh, strategies where all the different segments of the community work together to alleviate those problems. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 what Americans do, you know, that when there's a problem, you get everybody together and you work together to solve it. And there's ways that you can do it effectively. And what we try to do at the Institute is help communities actually do those things effectively. Fran, do you have an example of a really good model of a you know, uh, prevention prepared community? Actually, yes, and Jane and I work hand in hand uh, on this uh, uh, in between the federal government and our community coalitions, uh, working through what we call the strategic prevention framework uh, model. And basically what that means is that we teach communities, as Jane has already mentioned, to do five different steps. And um, going in abbreviated version, you want a community to come together just to discuss the problems that they see do an actual assessment. They're taught how to do that so that they have data. Learn how what to do with that data and prioritize your problem. Go after an evidence-based practice that will min mitigate the problem and at least address it. And then the all-important thing that we didn't used to do on a regular universal level, which is to evaluate what you just did, and then you start over again. And this is a process that's been going on in our communities on several different 
different types of coalitions, both in family communities, college campus communities, um, rural, urban, any possible community structure you can think of across the country for the last decade. And it's really showing good results that community change is happening around the topics that we've been talking about here today. What are some of those good results? Uh, redu reduction in uh, underage drinking. Between the ages of 8 and 16, we're reducing uh, the use of alcohol among our young people. However, we are seeing an increase between the ages of 17 and 20, 21. So that's a problem area for us and we're working with our communities and that's something that Jane would take in her training and, and, and highlight. Suicide prevention. Suicide prevention going through this type of a model also is raising the awareness. We have over 4,000 young people each year die of suicide. Now what's equally important is that from each suicide, each one of those 4,000 has anywhere from one to 200 attempts. So this is a major problem. A community, when they assess, and they have had a couple of suicides of young people in their, or older adults in their community, then they will target a program directed to that. We're seeing results of that as well. Well, when we come back, I want to go back to talking about some of the other programs that exist, and I want to see what how hospitals and how youth organizations can also uh, get in the mix to solve all these problems. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. They tell me I was there, but I don't remember. I don't know where I really was. I do not know what I had for breakfast. I do not know who won the game. I don't recognize this man. If you or someone you know is struggling with a drug or alcohol problem, there is a solution. Recovery. Call 1-800-662-HELP for information and for hope. Through treatment, my life's a whole lot brighter now. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So screening and brief intervention is what we call a secondary prevention approach. So it's a way of intercepting people who might be already engaging in risky substance abuse behavior and trying to reduce their use and reduce the harm that they might experience from their substance use. We decided to do our intervention in this mental health clinic and that's something that hadn't been done before. So we decided to use this very brief screening and brief intervention tool called the ASSIST. It's the Alcohol, Smoking, and Substance Involvement Screening Test, which was developed by the World Health Organization. Well, we use the ASSIST results in intervention planning quite immediately. That's part of the beauty of the ASSIST, that it has kind of a built-in intervention that, based on the score that's deduced from the eight questions of the ASSIST, you're kind of guided to do a validating response, a brief intervention, or an intervention with kind of a referral to treatment or a discussion about kind of getting further treatment. And in that ASSIST, they'll provide much more detailed information on their pattern of usage of various substances. And we have a fair amount of detail that we end up with as a result of their completing computerized assist. One of the things we use with the assist results is kind of looking at how maybe the substance use is impacting the current, their presenting issues. So if it's depression or anxiety, maybe how the substance use is exacerbating that. And we'll give some education about that, the risk factors. And then we'll also explore the consequences with respect to the presenting concerns. Over the course of counseling, we'll actively look at the student's ambivalence or, or values with respect to the substance use as it relates to the presenting concerns. Well, our program here 
I think is a really great resource for UCLA. Not only do the students here benefit from the screening and brief intervention services, but the health center here on campus is referring students here who they feel might be at risk for substance use. One of the lessons we learned from the research we did here was that for students who really have a high score on the assist who are at risk for what we'd call chemical dependency, it's very hard to convince someone that just because they're having a lot of negative consequences from what they're doing that they should get treatment for that. So we really needed an intermediary step. You know, no matter how how at risk they are, most people, it's a hallmark of substance abuse that they just don't feel that at risk. When we recognize that a student requires more extensive treatment or intervention related to a chemical dependency issue, we uh, collaborate with a substance abuse and dependence treatment facility that's actually located near campus named the Matrix Institute and it's also covered under the student health insurance plan. We also need to address the broader environment so we need to look at ways of making alcohol and drugs less accessible to students. And so it's very important to have the one-on-one -on -one interventions, but also to have the broader environmental strategies and policy strategies to address this problem comprehensively. Dr. Green, we were talking about certainly prevention prepared communities. Within that, can you talk a little bit about what role hospitals, you know, and using uh, Howard University Hospital as an example, um, are doing or should be doing in order to engage in these efforts? I'm glad you asked that question, Yvette. Uh, the hospital has suicide prevention, uh, suicide groups, as well as uh, recover, people who have recovered from post-traumatic stress disorder. So there are some groups to help and address some of these issues, but there's still a larger community that we need to get help to. The identifying and screening, not only for just substance abuse, but for the mental health that, that Jordan was talking about previously, so you can identify patients a little earlier. Uh, you start seeing the patterns uh, this person got shot last year and they got shot this year. Uh, they're under the age of 17 and as a trend may go, that third time may be a fatal mm -hmm. one. So getting the family involved, getting the child protective services, getting our community involved to really try to address some of the greater issues that may be going on and not just putting the patient right back out on the street, but you need resources and an organized community and support system. You may be able to identify it, but if you can't send the patient anywhere to get that help, your identification becomes a stopping point. Uh, so we really want to encourage um, the acquisition of more resources. Mm -hmm. Similarly with our SBIRT program, we have a great APRA system, but because of our inability... What is an APRA system? APRA is our, is our intake center that helps to send patients who need to go into a recovery program, whatever the recovery program may be, it helps to identify beds that are open in the city. Uh, what we would like to do is to really be able to have that interposition point, somewhere where you can take the person in so they don't have to go back out on the street mm -hmm. before they can get into the intake system. Very good. Um, our concerns are that we may be losing people. They may have agreed to go into the system, but they had to go back out on the street first and now they didn't come back. So we feel, and then the beds may not be available for a long time and that becomes a concern for us also. Jordan, as a person who went through the system and had support, in the ideal world, uh, what would you have preferred to have had in order for you to not have, you know, not, not go through what you went through? Yeah, I wish it didn't take a suicide attempt like myself to um, have to get to the point where I wanted to be, support system wise. Um, one thing that I've truly benefited from that is different from before um, my suicide attempt is that I have one psychiatrist. Before I had a therapist and a psychiatrist. Therapist was very warm, was there to hear you talk. The psychiatrist was not very warm and was there to administer medicine. There was a lack of communication between the two as far as what medicine I should be taking, whether it was the right dosage. Um, something I truly benefit now is, uh, is having a psychiatrist who is both my therapist and administers my medicine, which truly, again, is something that helps me um, emotionally and mentally, mm -hmm. knowing that, that there's never going to be a lapse in that communication. Mm -hmm. Let's shift a little bit, Fran, and talk about some of the recent research. What is it telling us that we still need to do in the area of early intervention and prevention? We need to spend more time in really figuring out what are some of the signs and symptoms of diagnosing 
um, mental, mental illness in particular. We now know that by age of 14, um, we can begin to uh, see the signs of mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, uh, and, and even schizophrenia at that age, some signs. Um, those signs also, we also have just recently learned that they, uh, there are other signs that start to appear to give us a little uh, insight uh, around two to three years earlier. So we're really starting to reach into those younger populations. We also need to see the, uh, to balance out the um, brain disease part of, of mental health, mental illness rather, and, and see what can we do about that, like and learn from the substance abuse world of their issues with, with looking at how the brain interacts with, with our enzymes, which interacts with the disease itself. As with most chronic illnesses, even though we've come so far with addictions and in mental illness, we still are not at the same level of knowledge and expertise that we are with learning about diabetes and cancer and heart disease and even Alzheimer's disease. So we have, we have come a long way, but we have, we have a lot longer to go to be able to get this to a level where all doctor, physicians um, like Dr. Green, who understands the behavioral health issues and understands addictions. Um, so it becomes just one of the many physical health issues that we look at. And within the context of SAMHSA and the uh, strategic initiatives, uh, where is that going to take us uh, to further the science? Well, w SAMHSA has uh, eight strategic initiatives. Uh, we're focusing on everything from prevention uh, right straight through to uh, several different populations. We're looking at trauma and justice issues. We're looking at the military because the military right now and the military families are really um, using the services that we have and are showing signs of both mental illness issues around depression and anxiety and suicide um, as well as addiction. And we know a little bit more about addiction, but we are really really learning now some of the other areas of mental health. We're also focusing in on um, health um, electronics technology so that we can start to speak to each other across all symptoms, uh, systems rather. So the doctors, physical doctors can talk to the, your psychiatrist and we can, and therapists can talk to other therapists, not only in the United States, but across the world where there has been some other advances. And we're doing several other um, issues. We're looking at um, the recovery, which we, we, I know that you, this is why we're all here to look further into what does recovery really talk about uh, and uh, and then first and the last but certainly not least and certainly I haven't I even told you all of them but public education and communication we are jumping into the new media realm so that we can reach the youngest of young and the oldest of old so we'll do traditional TV commercials and we'll do traditional radio spots but we also are on on our computers and we're on our laptops and young kids were on their telephones. So we are Twittering and tweeting and Facebooking and blogging and all the rest mm -hmm. because we must get this information out to everybody. Yes, indeed. Jane, in terms of the Institute, beyond the prevention prepared communities, mm -hmm. what other exciting areas are we looking at within the Institute? Well, a couple of things that we're really excited about is um, we're about to hold our 21st annual leadership forum. And at that um, conference, which is a really large conference of people who are involved in this work in their communities, we're going to be recognizing communities that have done an exceptional job of um, doing what we talked about earlier, which is putting together strong uh, community coalitions. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm also excited about the fact that we've been working really hard uh, to bring community coalitions and the research community together um, and do what we call community-based participatory research. Um, I think as everybody knows, there's lots of really good research out there about what works and what doesn't work, but that doesn't always filter down to communities in well, a the way communities need to know that's about useful it, so. and helpful. So by combining researchers and communities working together uh, where, where they're, they're working in partnership, uh, we really increase the likelihood of first getting those best practices down to communities, but secondly forming the research agenda or informing the research agenda uh, so re researchers can put together research that's relevant for communities. So that's just a couple of things I'm real excited about. And the results get down to someone like Jordan who's out talking yeah. to the schools. Yeah. Why is it important, Jordan? I want you to make that uh, broadly known. Why is it important for schools to have individuals like yourself 
go and speak to the student body and speak to parents? Um, I think it's important to have you know someone speak on mental health like myself to uh, go into schools basically to generate and to start a conversation because what I think happens is there's a conversation started and that generates a lot of attention and from that attention that's when the education begins and that's what I like to do is just to plant a seed when I go to speak at those schools so that the kids there, the parents there, the teachers there have something to think about and the goal is that when I get home at the end of the day after speaking to that school they're just not talking about those mental health issues and topics the next day, the next week, the next month but for months and years after that and that's that's why I think it's important, like um, Active Minds, the organization that I speak for, there's over 300 new branches over in the entire country and that's for young adults to express how they feel, to tell their own stories and to feel like they truly belong in the mental health community and I think it's great. Very good. Uh, Fran, final yes. thoughts? Collaboration. I think that most of what we're talking about here is collaboration. We cannot do it alone. We have to work with our, at the federal level, we're working with all our federal partners from everything from a prescription drug abuse problem with the, with the Federal Drug Administration. We're working with the Office of National Drug Control Policy on some of our substance abuse issues, particularly targeting young people and older, and older adults. We're also looking, um, working with uh, the Center for Disease Control. We're just working and working with our partners. We're asking states to do exactly the same thing. We want to give out the messages that we are trying to bring behavioral health into the primary world of health, meaning in a much simpler way, bringing substance abuse and mental health issues to the world of physical health. Dr. Green, final thoughts. I'd like to just say that promoting the community think tanks such as DC Rock and other such initiatives that are there to help and provide additional services, they've addressed needs, are a way for us to combine the healthcare professionals to outside community organizations so we aren't out there alone. There are other people who are working on these initiatives and we need to combine our efforts. Mm -hmm. Jane, final thoughts. One, the, one final thought. Um, I think it's really helpful when communities have people like Jordan and Wendy, our doctor, um, involved in these kinds of efforts. Um, it's, it's so essential to have young people become good community problem solvers, and it's really, really important to have um, our professionals in the community working on these problems, um, not only from, from a programmatic aspect, but from a systems change and policy aspect, because we all know there's good programs out there. Um, but it's really necessary to take them to scale and institutionalize them. Very good. And if communities want to get engaged and involved, there's no better opportunity than to do so to do during National Recovery Month. Recovery Month is celebrated every September. There are materials online that you can use. And it's really looked at and prepared all year round. So you can get engaged in Recovery Month all year round. We hope that you do so and we hope that you continue to spread the word that prevention works, treatment is effective, and recovery is possible. Thank you for being with us. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.